Interpreting Data, Graphs and Charts, Part 1. So far, we have had a look at the types of data and the basic descriptive statistics, including our measures of distribution, measures of central tendency, and dispersion. Now we're going to move on to actually have a look at the mechanisms for interpreting a statistical data. As with our choices around the measures of central tendency, the choice of the type of graph that we use is also dependent on the type of variable that is being interpreted, i.e. whether it is a nominal, ordinal or a scale variable. Nominal and ordinal data is based on the selection of categories, so whether that's um, a yes or a no, or whether that's a strongly agree to strongly disagree. Therefore, our graphs that represent nominal and ordinal data have to have categories. So that generally comes in the form of either um, bars or pie slices. Scale data, which we know is being either interval or ratio, is numeric. And therefore, this is best represented by things like, say, for example, uh, line graphs and histograms. And we're going to have a look at each of these different types of charts in turn. So the first type of chart we're going to look at is pie charts. Now pie charts use either a slice or a segment um, of the pie to represent each category and each of those slices or segments is shown in relation to the whole pie. As we discussed it's often used for data that has categories so that is nominal and ordinal data. Um, but it's always useful to remember when thinking about pie charts that it, it's only useful to represent data where there actually is a relative difference between each, between each type of category. So sometimes it can be hard to judge the relative difference of each slice if there's no real difference between the size of them. So if, say for example, we have our population and we look at the gender of that population. If 50% are male and 50% are female, on a pie chart, it doesn't really show us anything of any value because really there isn't much difference between the two. Well, there's no difference at all between the two slices of the pie. Equally, when we're looking at using pie charts, it's also not particularly useful to use pie charts when we have a very large number of categories as this often leads to there being way too many slices of the pie and it can look very confusing. It makes it difficult to actually pick out what the important bits of information are if say for example we have a pie chart with 10 different slices because those slices are likely to represent relatively small proportions of our data it's very difficult to see what our distribution ends up looking like. So if there are a large number of categories within our data, within our particular variable that we're looking at, then the only way to avoid presenting pie charts that have too much detail is usually to aggregate up some of those categories into broader groups um, and or combine all of our sort of what we call rare values, so the values that don't occur very often, into um, a category that is labelled as other it is also useful to uh, include value labels and percentages for each category as it helps us to see, um, to see what our pie slices actually represent. This slide here shows an example um, of a pie chart and you can see here that we have at the top of the pie chart we have a title which describes what the pie chart is actually representing the pie chart itself we have only four categories and they are relatively distinct from each other so that we so that we have an idea we can judge the relative size of each of those we can see that we have value labels ascribed to each section of the pie so the first one is 15% if we start from 12 o'clock and move around um, the second one is 32% the third is 36 and the fourth is 17 we also have a legend at the bottom of the pie chart which gives us, which tells us what each of the pies represent. So the darkest of the purple pies is 1 to 15 hours and is um, associated with 15% of the people who answered the question and so on and so forth.
So that shows a good example of what a pie chart can do and what a pie chart looks like. Now another way of representing data that is in the form of category, so either nominal or ordinal data, is by using a bar chart. Now bar charts actually use a, an individual bar to represent each particular category within a variable. The size of each bar is visually very clear to see and that makes it very easy to judge the relative size of bars. So if you have a number of different categories within your variable and you use a bar chart it makes it very easy to see that maybe there are more responses within one category than another. Um, bar charts work really particularly well for ordinal data. Okay, and it works for ordinal data because you can arrange your bars in order of the categories, i.e. from good to bad or from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And it gives you an idea of the flow of your data. As with pie charts, there is of course a limit to how many categories that you can reasonably represent on a bar, ch on a bar chart. Too many bars and the actual visual display of the data becomes very lost. So if we have, say, 15 bars in a bar chart, it becomes very difficult to actually pick out, you know, which category has the most um, and what does the flow of the data look like. Therefore, similarly with pie charts, sometimes it's useful to aggregate or combine some categories if there are too many to represent. It's also quite useful if we want to compare different types of categories if we use what we call clustered bar charts and we're going to have a look at two examples of bar charts. We're going to have a look at a single bar chart and we're going to have a look at a clustered bar chart to show you what we mean. Now this slide here shows an example of a single bar chart. Okay, and We can see at the top we have a title which tells us what the bar chart represents. On each axis we have a label which tells us what each of those mean. So we have a chart that has a look at age of our survey respondents in years. Along the bottom axis, so along the horizontal axis, we have our respondents age in years. And we, that's represented by a percentage. And it goes from under 19, um, starting on the left, all the way up to age 65 and over on the right. So you can see here we have an ordinal variable, okay, so it has some categories but they're ordered. We can see that order very clearly on a bar chart moving from left to right with the lowest age up to the highest age. We can see very clearly with the, with the bars how our data is, is distributed. So we can see a slow rise from under 19 up to our peak, up to our peak bar of aged between 40 to 49 which represents 28 percent of our population and starts sloping downwards as we hit 50 and over. So we can see from that bar chart we can have a look at what the shape of the distribution looks like, we can have a look at which category or which categories represent the most people and so on and so forth. Now we may want to look at this particular variable by another. So we may want to have a look at our variable of age of respondents, but we might want to have a look at it by gender. And this example here is what we mean by when we mean a clustered bar chart. So here we have the results for males in the study, and we have results for females in the study too. So here we can have a look at the shape of our data. And for males in the study, we can see that our shape is very similar to the the slide previously, but we have our bulk in this data set occurring between the 40 to 64 year old bracket, which make up nearly 50% of our total data. For females, we can see that for some reason in this sample, um, this hypothetical sample, um, we have a relatively low occurrence of a low proportion of our female population between the 25 and 39 year old age group, but we have a relatively large proportion proportion is we have one third at age between 40 and 49. So we can see by using these two different bars together we can start looking at how the variable varies across males and females. So we can see that 
for, say for example, our under 19s and our 19s to 24, we have more females as a proportion uh, within this age group compared to males and so on and so forth. Now it's also useful to remember at this stage that with both single and with cluster bar charts, bars can also be represented not just vertically, as is shown here, so not just by upright bars, but by also by horizontal bars as well. And you do sometimes see bar charts represented horizontally and not just vertically as we have in these examples here. So bar charts, they're used to represent categorical data. But if we want to have a, if we want to have a look at our scale data, so whether that's interval or ratio, we will end up using histograms rather than bar charts. Now there is a difference between histograms and bar charts. In bar charts, our bars are distinct from each other. There is there's a gap in between each bar. With histograms, the bars actually touch to represent our continuous data. We construct a histogram from a frequency table and we start off by using the intervals from our frequency table, so our, say for example, our age in years, okay, we construct that from our frequency table and we place those on our horizontal or our x axes. Our values that are needed for the frequencies are represented on the vertical axes or the y axes. And the frequencies of each of these are depicted by the height of the bar and that corresponds to each interval. So let's actually have a look at an example. So if we take this as an example, if we consider the an interval set of data, okay, that runs from we have that runs from four to forty seven. If we plotted this data on a graph, it would be relatively meaningless. Okay, it would just show us various different points in the graph. It wouldn't really make an awful lot of sense. But if we put the data into ranges, um, or we call them bins, it enables us to start almost categorizing our data. So we move, so we take our interval data set that has a number of values from 4 to 47. We construct a number of different convenient ranges. Okay, in this case we're looking at uh, five different ranges from 1 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and 40 to 50. Okay, we count how many times a value occurs within each range and put that as our frequency. So we have value from 1 to less than 10 occurs twice with values of 4 and 9. Values from 10 to less than 20 occur twice with values of 10 and 17 and so on and so forth. So we put our data and we construct a frequency table out of our data and we plot that on a histogram as you can see in the example here. So this is our fourth chart and it's our age of our respondents in years and you can see here that we have exactly what we have plotted in our frequency table. We have our bins Okay, or our categories that we've created of our age, of our ages, and we fill those up with the number of values that occur within those ranges. Now, it's important to note that changing the size of the bins, so, so changing the ranges of data that, that you that you collect, will change the appearance of your graph and will change the conclusions that you may end up drawing from it. So as you can see with this histogram, you'll also notice on the right hand side, we have the mean, the median and the standard deviation noted as well. Now we have these things written down because obviously we are looking at scale data, so that's interval or ratio. And in these cases, um, these measures are important things to think about, so the mean, median and standard deviation. The next type of chart we're going to have a look at is a line graph. Now scale data, that's interval or ratio, can use line graphs and why? Because only scale data has any form of numeric, real numeric value and so we can use, we can plot those numeric values on a line graph. 
The example that we have here shows a relatively simple um, representation of some data. So it shows uh, temperature over one week and we start off on day one and we have a temperature of roughly 18 degrees and we are plotting the temperature over the course of one week, so from day one to day seven. So line graphs are particularly useful for actually showing a change in our scale data over time. In this example of a line graph, when we are looking at the distribution of values in one variable, um, we're really looking at a frequency, okay, which is a little bit better suited to a, to a histogram. So in the example that we see here, which is test scores, some hypothetical data for test scores for students in 2011, the line graph doesn't actually really show us what the distribution of data really looks like. And actually, by representing it on a line graph, it gives the impression that there is some relationship between the test score of one student to the next, when of course really what we're looking at here is a set of discrete values, they're just simply a test score for each student. So in this case, we're actually better off looking at something like a frequency table and then putting that into a histogram. With a previous case where we're having a look at temperature over the period of a week, it gives us a good idea of, of a trend, of a trend line happening so we can see what the relationship is between one day to the next and we can see overall what our value is going to be for our temperature across the course of a week. So line graphs really typically show trends rather than all the values of a variable and choosing which one you want to use so whether a histogram or a line graph will depend on what you want to say. So if you're looking at trends you're probably better off using a line graph, whereas if you're actually showing more about the distribution of data, okay, so you want to have a look at all of the values within a particular variable, then a histogram is, is, is more appropriate.